and we've got a fabulous panel, dare I say it, um, uh, I'm getting myself. Uh, many of you will know uh, Lyria from the University of New South Wales, um, who's done a lot of work in the uh, national security area um, and work in biometrics as well. Um, in fact, here is a bit of a polymath, really. Um, she also teaches property and trust, the two of the driest legal subjects that could be imagined, and um, managed to uh, win a prize, I noticed, uh, recently for uh, a legal essay to do with technology in the law that was judged by, amongst others, uh, Sir, Sir William Gummow, um, Bill Gummow, um, who taught me uh, property and trust. So I know what a hard marker he is, <laughs> and if Lyria came top of the class, um, she's clearly terrific. Um, uh, we also have Elizabeth Tidd, our Information Commissioner from New South Wales. For those of you not familiar with the New South Wales environment, um, we have an Information and Privacy uh, Commission in New South Wales, and Elizabeth is the boss. And are you acting Privacy Commissioner until a new Privacy Right, right. And uh, Elizabeth will shortly be joined by a new um, <coughs> privacy commissioner whose name is Samantha Gavel, uh, and who starts in September. And uh, Elizabeth is also the New South Wales Open Data Advocate. What is that I hear you say? Well, uh, Elizabeth will tell us. Um, we have uh, Neil Sutherland, who uh, has been working in the Australian health space for many years, uh, including uh, uh, heading BCG's Australian health practice. <coughs> and more recently, uh, I've had the pleasure of coming to know Neil in his relatively new role, the year? Uh, six months. Six months. Uh, as the CEO of Quantium Health Solutions. For those of you who don't know, Quantium uh, is probably the leading uh, Australian health data analytics company and uh, quantum health, uh, uh, health outcomes. outcomes. QHO, um, quantum health outcomes uh, is a new joint venture between um, quantum and a South African group called the Discovery Group, uh, who operate internationally under the Vitality Health brands. And uh, Neil knows a lot about uh, joining data and analysing data, so is also uh, an ideal panellist. So what I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time talking about the paper um, that I recently wrote, which is uh, available in the materials now um, for this conference. And that's really to lead into the discussion that we'd like to have around uh, data linkage, open government, and privacy and um, its interface with uh, biometrics. And um, just to prove that uh, I have more than paid lip service to the title of this conference on biometrics, I want to talk about some of the new uh, sources of data and um, how they are being used and potentially then lead into the issues around uh, issues of ethics, of social acceptability of new uses of health and biometric data. So, let me start with the Internet of Things, a topic that I talk about quite a bit. Um, today, your average consumer in an advanced industrial uh, economy has around four IoT devices that um, they have already enabled. Um, globally, uh, 127 new IoT devices connect to the internet every second, um, according to McKinsey. You'll hear various figures about the number of IoT devices, 50 billion, whatever, um, uh, by 2050, who knows, it's going to be a very large number. It is significantly not larger than the number of humans that are connected to the internet. Um, but most significantly, and the point that um, really is not brought out enough about the IoT is, and I'm quoting uh, McKinsey, McKinsey again was the source of the figure of 127 new devices every second. McKinsey reckoned that by 2022, 100% of the population in countries like Australia will have uh, low-powered wide area 
uh, uh, network coverage, healthy um, uh, uh, WAN. And the significance of that is that, um, of course, these devices connect to the internet by a very expensive thing called a SIM card. Uh, and um, these devices are, as you know, expensive devices to buy. Um, the world that we're going into is a world where the IoT device is already getting down to around $3 a device. Terrific, thank you. And um, coming down um, to a dollar a device. Uh, the connectivity to the uh, an LP WAN um, is about a dollar a year. Uh, and you've got a battery life of uh, about 10 years uh, on a device that on current technology is about the size of a 20 cent piece. So if you think about it, if you've got uh, $2 for uh, device and connectivity together, um, and that connectivity lasting for uh, 10 years on a single battery, it then becomes economic, for example, for the University of Wollongong to put that device under every chair in this room so they know when the chairs walk off to offices and which offices to go to to reclaim the chair and bring them back here. Thousands of applications uh, like that. Um, so how are those things changing the world as we know it today? Well, let me quote from The Guardian of the 23rd of April uh, sorry, 23rd of June, so relatively recently. Short quote, so I'll just quote it verbatim. Richard Darbeck told police a masked intruder assaulted him and killed his wife in their Connecticut home. His wife's Fitbit told another story and Debart was charged with murder. James Bates said an acquaintance accidentally drowned in his hot tub in Arkansas. Detectives suspected foul play and obtained data from Bates' Amazon Echo device. Bates was charged with murder. Ross Compton told investigators he woke up to find his Ohio home on fire and climbed through a window to escape the flames. Compton's pacemaker suggested otherwise. He was charged with arson and insurance fraud. All three men, besides pleading in innocence, have one thing in common. Digital devices may help put them behind bars and each of them in criminal history is some of the first perpetrators busted by the Internet of Things. And let me give you one other example that I picked up uh, a bit earlier this year of a doctor from Brentwood, California, who was convicted of assaulting two bike riders with his car. And he claimed that the bicyclists had caused the accident by riding dangerously. Prosecutors argued that based on the cyclist's GPS devices, they were travelling at approximately 30 miles per hour. And Thompson could easily have passed them. And that evidence was used to convict him. <coughs> he received, would you believe, a five-year prison sentence. Um, would some drivers, speaking of the cyclists, um, were treated that way in Australia. Even if you're not using a bike, biking app, your phone is still collecting the data. And even if you're turning off location services for individual apps, your phone is still collecting it. Don't think that because you've tried to stop certain app providers from tracking you, you are not being tracked. So they're just a few examples of how um, IoT devices, including health and wellness related devices, uh, tell interesting stories about our lives and put that together with the declining cost of IoT devices and their increasing range. Uh, and you get some interesting problems that are going to come up with the future. Now, why is this of interest to me as uh, a lawyer and somebody working in the data commercialisation space today? Well, the short answer is that as I started to venture into uses of um, health data, I quickly discovered that I was in a quicksand of uh, that existed between two worlds. The worlds of the conduct of privacy impact assessments upon commercial applications of non-health related data, and the world over here of medical research with its highly regulated um, uh, Herrix and um, the US and UK equivalents, all built around the concept of 
um, human research, uh, typically in a medical environment, and then this big land in the middle that where um, health-related data that involved humans was being used for entirely non-health-related applications or to do community studies, population health studies, that did not have effects on the individuals who were within the sample group. And then when I started to kind of break apart the concepts of what is research, what is medical research, I quickly discovered that those concepts were um, not very well articulated at all um, because it had always been assumed that one would go to the, the Herrick world um, if it was anything to do with, uh, with uh, research involving individuals that had been traditionally human research um, uh, and not research that was related to, uh, as it were, non-human ap non affecting applications or non-individual human affecting applications. And then when I talked to the data scientists, I discovered that they came from a fundamentally different world where they had not had training around uh, medical ethics um, or application of ethics in research. So they had to learn a new language around uh, ethics and social equity, and social responsibility, um, and to incorporate that language into their consideration, already they were familiar with, of privacy and the conduct of privacy impact assessments. So we had two worlds really, the world of data scientists grown out of people with maths and physics, uh, backgrounds, hard sciences, accustomed to dealing with systems, not really um, that uh, accustomed to dealing with humans, probably in both the social and the intellectual sense. And the world over here of um, uh, your doctors, your medical researchers, who are sort of deeply steeped in um, the Human Research Ethics Committee processes, uh, used to moving at a much slower speed than the commercial data scientists over here are used to working at, and a clash of two worlds. So my paper was an attempt to find the middle ground between these two worlds. Was it a world where privacy impact assessments expanded their um, uh, range of concerns that they addressed to address social equity, issues of algorithmic discrimination, all of those other issues around the uses of data that are now being uh, explored in the literature and increasingly in the daily newspapers? Uh, or um, did we try and bring the Herrick world across towards um, privacy impact assessments and uh, fill the middle ground uh, in that way? And um, there were a number of very prominent and fine privacy academics who in recent years have uh, talked about expanding the range of privacy impact assessments to include social responsibility, social equity issues, people like um, uh, the guys from the Information Accountability Foundation, Marty Abrams and uh, Peter Cullen, uh, guys like, um, I'm going to have a metal block now, uh, Ryan Cato, who's written about uh, CR, CSRB, consumer research, anyway, CRSPs or something like that. Um, they're referred to in my paper. Various other uh, academics, uh, and leading practitioners who've thought about the ways that you might change the scope of a privacy impact assessment to address social responsibility, social ethics issues. What I concluded was that um, firstly, the Human Research Ethics Committee model was not the appropriate model to bring across to span onto privacy impact assessment. And secondly, that the people that you needed to, in the room, around the table, to think about social responsibility and ethics issues were actually different from the privacy professionals who conduct the privacy impact assessments. And indeed, the two processes were quite distinct as to what was being considered and the points of a data analytics process at which you would consider those things. So I 
attempted in the paper to find a way of overlaying uh, ethics and social responsibility review on a privacy impact assessment review using differently constituted um, uh, bodies but working in essence in tandem. Now, there's another reason to do it that way and it's this. Quite often what's happening in these projects now is not outcomes which are designed to affect the individuals who are, who are in the cohort that is the basis for the study. Often what the study is for is to devise an algorithm um, based upon analysis of the cohort that you then, uh, as it were, put into the wild or you use across a bigger cohort that um, uh, will not include the original cohort or where the original cohort is anonymised into the broader cohort. So in that uh, circumstance, you're not in fact talking about an outcome on the cohorts that are being analysed, you're talking about an outcome through an algorithm applied to the population more generally or a broader cohort. So the privacy impact assessment um, often requires a two-stage process. It's around the management of the information into the environment where the analysis of the cohort uh, is conducted, ensuring that that information is then hermetically sealed um, in that environment so that uh, the, uh, the outcomes uh, that from the analysis of that cohort can't go into the broader um, uh, community or otherwise go into the wild and be subject to re-identification attack through mosaic analysis or whatever. So it seemed to me there was a two-stage issue. Firstly, how you curate and manage um, the identified or anonymised environment um, that you use to produce, um, that you use to do the analysis that might then generate the algorithms. And that is essentially is a privacy impact assessment process around how do we de-identify data into the environment, then how do we manage that environment so it's hermetically sealed. And then secondly, there's the issue as to um, the outputs from that environment, including any algorithms, and the outcomes of the application of those algorithms in the community generally, and how do you assess those outputs and outcomes. That's not um, a privacy impact assessment issue other than ensuring that um, the outputs are not of themselves capable of re-identification attack um, so that you have mosaic effect um, uh, re-identification uh, uh, when those outputs go into the market. So that was my um, what I was trying to do uh, in this paper. And when I looked across at the other material that had been written around this space, including you know, the volumes that have been written on uh, application of HIPAA and management of health information in the US, and now a, a sort of increasing um, almost torrent of material in Europe coming out, out of uh, how da data privacy impact assessments will be done under the new GDPR, there wasn't anything really that I thought really hit the mark around um, the issue that um, uh, I was increasingly encountering around uh, uses of uh, human related information to derive uh, algorithms, assessments, uh, uh, insights about the population generally. So that was the point at which um, I thought, well, okay, who is our panel to talk about this today? And the three people who came to mind um, first, I'm very glad to say, are uh, sitting next to me right now and who bring sort of different perspectives, different areas of knowledge around this space. And uh, I won't prejudge what they're going to say, I'll just let them say. <coughs>